The Ottoman Empire is definitely one of history's more interesting civilizations. As far as Islamic dynasties go, it lasted a very long time, 600 years in fact. And within those 600 years, there was remarkably little dynastic conflict. It's interesting because very early on, even if there was a couple cases where sultans were deposed or abdicated, they were able to establish a principle that a member of the House of Osman always had to sit on the throne. And there was never really a real possibility of there being a military coup or a change in the form of government. Which is interesting. Its longevity is also fascinating given how diverse it was. The Ottoman Empire spanned three continents and contained Muslim, uh, Sunnis, Shias, Orthodox, Catholics, Armenian Apostolic. It contained all kinds of different groups and minorities and religions, and yet it did succeed in lasting for 600 years. And while there often was brutal repression of minorities, it was largely staple for most of its existence. And even once we get into World War I, the, the Arab revolt, from my understanding, is kind of played up because Lawrence did a good job of romancing it. And there, was, there wasn't mass defections from the Arab regiments of the Ottoman army. Almost all of them stayed loyal to the Sultan. Another thing that's interesting about the Ottoman Empire is compared to a lot of states that I've talked about in the past, like Russia or any other number of kind of despotic third world, what we would call today third world monarchies, the Ottoman Empire was very proactive in trying to reform. Pretty much every time they lost a war, they went through a period of reform where they tried to clean up the bureaucracy, you know, like kick out the, the corrupt people. They, they would often bring in like military advisors from Germany or Britain or wherever and try to reform the army along those lines, adopt the latest and newest technology. Eventually in the 19th century, uh, once we get to the reforms of Tanzimat, they actually went further than a lot of European countries did in introducing a liberal constitution and in introducing equality before the law. Um, universal adult male, well, it wasn't quite universal adult male suffrage, but adult male suffrage and elected parliament. They introduced a lot of these things earlier than many countries did, certainly a lot earlier than Russia did, and to a certain extent earlier than Austro-Hungary did. And it's not like they tried this once and then they gave up. They tried this a number of times. Um, almost continually they went through reform periods, and yet it didn't really seem to help that much. Well, I think the Ottomans performed better than anyone thought they were going to in World War I. The truth of the matter is their state still collapsed. The House of Osman was overthrown and the Sultan Caliph ruled from Constantinople no more. So the interesting question is what happened? Why did this once mighty empire that had been one of the innovate, great innovators in, in military matters, had who had built one of the world's first modern professional armies, who had innovated greatly in, in infantry tactics and in cavalry tactics and the use of firearms, and who had one of the best logistical systems the world has ever seen. It, interestingly, when they the Ottomans invaded parts of Europe or the Armenia or went into Persia, generally speaking, they were able to supply themselves from Constantinople. The bureaucracy was very effective. And for a long time, they basically ran roughshod over Europe, Persia, and the rest of the Middle East. So why did things go so bad? Why did this empire collapse? Now, the thing to keep in mind about the Ottoman Empire, and this is like, probably the most similar case to this would be the Habsburg Empire or Austro-Hungary or whatever you want to call it, is the we think of the Ottomans today as being Turkey as it being a Turkish empire, but that's not really the case. Turk kind of referred to the peasants of Anatolia. The, the upper class, or rather, I guess you could say the identity group of the Ottoman Empire were the Ottomans, or the Osmans, or whatever you want to call themselves. They had named themselves after the state, and they were defined by, first and foremost, loyalty to the Sultan Caliph, and second to kind of a general loyalty to Islam. And theoretically, at least, it didn't really matter what your religion was. 
you could still be loyal to the the sultan as being your your monarch your your overlord as it were while there was a confessional islamic state the broader identity like i said was defined more than anything else by personal loyalty to the sultan and kind of this this upper class that spoke generally speaking turkish persian and arabic and engaged in similar it had similar aesthetic taste engaged in similar poetry all these sorts of things and kind of what they wound up doing for the most part is they would take people primarily from the European provinces and they would generally speaking, kidnap them. They had the blood tax and they would be raised up in schools in Constantinople or other places in the empire. And they'd learn these three languages. They'd become Muslim and they'd become part of this common culture. And then they'd be sent around the country to administer regions. It's a bit like what happened with China, where you didn't have a formal nobility in quite the same way you had in Europe. You had a, a gentry, and they did have fiefs in the Ottoman Empire, but feudalism, if you can call it that in the Islamic world, is very different. But we, we won't get into that now. But you did have this, the Ottoman class, which was kind of like the Mandarin class in China, and they were defined more by their common culture and loyalty to the emperor than necessarily any modern concept of nationalism. Indeed, it kind of went through different eras. Sometimes it was more centralized. Sometimes it was more decentralized. The Ottomans had the millet system. So theoretically, at least, there was a degree of religious autonomy for Christians. Um, the head of basically Orthodox Christians was the Patriarch of Constantinople, and he had the right to represent them. And then the Arabs had their own representatives. And the Armenian Apostolic Church had their own too. And and if you were to ask the Sultan Caliph how he would define his role, I think he would first and foremost say, I am the Caliph, I am the leader of global Islam, specifically the leader of global uh, Sunni Islam. And he was very keen to take a lot of aesthetics and language and other things from the earlier caliphates, be it the Abbasid, etc. In fact... Throughout the Ottoman period, they always made sure to hold Constantinople, Mecca, Medina, Baghdad, and Cairo, which were all the traditional Islamic cities, Constantinople being the dream of Mohammed to take it. And that was a source of legitimacy. And when they conquered Egypt, they had the last Abbasid Caliphate vacate his position to uh, the Turkish Sultan. So they became Sultan and Caliph. And... Even though the Arabs and some of the other Muslim groups were not Turkish ethnically or culturally, they were largely content to be under the Sultan because he was the he was the Caliph. He was kind of like the Pope, I suppose you could say, of, of Sunni Islam. So my point being that the Ottoman Empire up until really Ataturk was in no way an ethnic state. It wasn't defined that way. It was a cultural and religious state. But above all, it was loyalty to the Sultan in Constantinople. Kind of like how the Habsburg Empire works. In the Habsburg Empire, you had Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, Muslims, etc. And there was a bunch of different ethnic groups and it was fairly decentralized. But what kind of bound them all together was that they were all subservient and they all held loyalty to the Habsburg monarchy. And that was kind of the glue that held it together. And the issue with a lot of these states that I think what ultimately happened with the Ottoman Empire is this just became a very dated concept once we get into modern nationalism. Uh, in particular, one of the, the main things that's blamed for this is when Napoleon invaded Egypt. Uh, the French brought a lot of uh, kind of the cultural baggage and the political baggage of the French Revolution with them. And they really tried to promote civic nationalism in Egypt. But we're getting a bit ahead of it ourselves. I'd say there's two things that ultimately led to the decline and fall of the Ottoman Empire. And given how long it took, it's a bit like the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, one can wish that one's decline lasts that long before one eventually collapses. Declining for 300 years is a lot better than uh, collapsing overnight, I guess. So the first thing that kind of really messed them up was the Thirty Years' War. Now, you might be saying, but Argent... Europe was busy during the Thirty Years' War. Uh, they were busy during the Thirty Years' War. The Ottomans basically had a free hand. 
Th that's true. But what had happened basically by this point in time is the Ottomans had determined the natural boundary of the land they were ruling directly was the Danube, which is the same conclusion the Romans came to. They had Transylvania, Wallachia, and Hungary, but those were under the control of vassal princes and tributaries who would send the money, men, and uh, agricultural products, but they did not appoint governors there in the same way they would in Greece or Thrace. So for the most part, up until we get into the Second Siege of Vienna, they weren't particularly interested in going any further. It was kind of the limit of their logistics. They briefly tried invading Italy, but that was a logistical disaster. So to the Ottomans' credit, they just gave up and never really tried to do it again. The thing was, around the time of the Thirty Years' War in Europe, the Safavids were really causing them a lot of trouble over in Persia, and you had a series of brutal slugfests that kind of eventually ended in, uh, I, could, I guess you could almost say a status quo antebellum. The, the actual borders changed a lot, but every time there's a treaty, it more or less was stable. Once again, it's interesting because it's, it's more or less the sort of borders you saw in a lot of cases with the, the Romans and Persians. And you had this kind of similar seesaw back and forth. The thing is, though, the Safavids were, well, fairly sophisticated for an Islamic, largely nomadic empire of this time period. They were nowhere near as sophisticated as what was going on in Europe. The, the Thirty Years' War is often referred to as the military revolution, and this is when you start to see better usage of cavalry, you start to see more firearms, you start to see better infantry tactics. Warfare just became a lot more professional and a lot more brutal and just a lot more, I guess you could say, scientific during this period. And the European countries had a 30-year-long slugfest to really learn all these lessons. In the Ottomans' case, they weren't fighting professional European armies. They were fighting the Safavids. And it's it's a very different type of combat when you're fighting them. It's a lot more, I guess you could say, logistical warfare, a lot more maneuver warfare, etc. And while the Janissaries were still well-trained soldiers, and they still were decently well-equipped, they just weren't keeping up with what was going on in Europe. The, the lecture series I listened to, they said, you only make an army good enough to defeat the people you're fighting, if, if that makes any sense. So the Ottoman army didn't really need to be better than it was because all they needed to be able to defeat was the Safavids, and they were able to defeat the Safavids. So when they kind of regained, decided, oh, why don't we attack Europe again, we have them coming up to the Second Battle of Vienna, and you have that in Lepanto. And at this point in time, the Ottomans suffer just a huge, huge defeat. Now, the actual number of people who die at the Second Siege of Vienna, I, I find kind of hard to determine exactly. I've seen estimates from like ten to 40,000. However many it was, the Ottomans lost a huge number of their professional soldiers. Uh, it devastated the Janissary Corps. They also lost a huge amount of supplies, in particular irreplaceable things like cannons and guns. And between that and Lepanto, they had seen their the army that they had put all the time and effort into basically get wiped out and they had to kind of start from scratch again. And so while they lost Hungary and they lost some of their European territories, one would think the situation salvageable. Okay, they got beat up pretty bad by Europe. They still have um, a large empire. They still have a huge, a relatively large population to, to draw upon. Couldn't they just do the same type of military modernization? And they tried that, but the big thing that happened around this point in time was Moscovy, which eventually became the Russian Empire, emerged. And that, I think, more than any other factor, is what ultimately doomed them. So let's think about this for a minute. All Orthodox Christians, at least what we would call Eastern Orthodox, if we're going into Oriental Orthodox or Ethiopian Orthodox, that's a bit different. But all Orthodox Christians... Everyone in the Balkans, uh, Armenia, I know Armenia is a slightly different thing, but just bear with me. Georgia, Middle East, there used to be a lot more Christians here, Greece, Crete. Most of the world's Orthodox Christians were under Ottoman control. All of them except for those in Russia. That was the only Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox majority country of any significant size that was independent. 
You also had an interesting scenario of all the Southern Slavs being under the control of the Ottoman Empire. And in fact, a lot of just the Slavic peoples in general, because you even get into kind of like some of the the Central or the Western Slav lands, like a lot of the... Um, the like even some southern portions of uh, Poland. So when Russia emerged on the stage, very early on, they announced that they were the protector of Eastern Christianity, that they were the savior who was going to come and save the various Orthodox peoples from the Turks. Beyond that, they also were the champion of Pan-Slavism. They're saying, we are, we are going to help all our Slavic brothers out, and we're going to kind of create this I don't know what you want to call it, like a proto-Eurasian Union or something, where all Slavs and all Orthodox are going to be under our protection. Now, the religious situation of Eastern Christians in the Ottoman Empire is kind of interesting. There was a lot of ambivalence regarding their position, because on one hand, it, it kind of sucked they were under the Ottomans who made them pay jizya and subjected them to some other humiliations. On the other hand, there was a lot of opportunities within the Ottoman Empire. Even if you were a Christian, you could still serve in the bureaucracy. A lot of Christians knew multiple languages, like they might know Greek or Armenian or something. And they were very useful as diplomats to communicate with Westerners who preferred to do business with a Christian than a Muslim. A lot of them kind of settled into their own uh, economic niche. Th there was some various opportunities for them. I mean, it, things weren't great for them, but they weren't as bad as they eventually got once we get to the 18th and 19th centuries. The other thing is, what was the alternative to Ottoman rule being controlled by Western Christians? Now, the feeling in that part of the world is that they had tried for, for hundreds of years to get Western Christianity to come and save them. And they had the Fourth Crusade, obviously, which people always talk about. But other than the First Crusade, most of them didn't really go anywhere. And you had Sigismund, who I think tried to relieve Constantinople twice, and he failed disastrously. And you had a bunch of other attempts, but they never really were able to, aside from the First Crusade, really do very much to help the Byzantines out. You even had multiple people, such as the last Byzantine emperor or Vlad, Vlad de Krul, Vlad Dracul, who converted to Eastern Catholicism on the understanding that if they, they mended the schism, then they would be able to get support from the Catholic Church and from the Western Catholic princes. So rightly or wrongly, the fact that the Ottomans took them over made them think, oh, these guys don't care about us. They, they don't care. They didn't come to save us, that, that kind of thing. The other thing was there is a fear if they were to fall under... Uh, a Catholic kingdom, then they would face repression, uh, they would be forcibly converted, and they would be treated as second-class citizens just under a Christian regime instead of an Islamic one. And to be honest, that's probably not a, a not unfair I, a not unfair expectation. I could definitely see a lot of Western Europeans doing that if they had taken over countries or areas with significant non-Catholic populations or non-Protestant populations. So I, I think that's a, a rational fear. Also, once again, that the likely people who would come in and, and kind of rescue them are like Germans and Italians and all these kind of weird foreigners who speak a different language and aren't culturally similar at all. But then Russia shows up and now you have a country that is huge, that is powerful, that is both Slavic and Orthodox. And almost immediately, this is when you start to get nationalism really start to emerge in these countries, in Bulgaria, Serbia, Bosnia, all these different countries, even within Greece. I know they're not Slavic, but they're, they're Orthodox. And they all start to clamor for Russia's support. And Russia, in its good real politique, uses this as an excuse to extend its influence to gradually break off some of the Ottoman vassal states and either annex them or turn them into satellite states of Russia. The idea being to eventually establish themselves as the rulers of the Balkans, if not directly, then indirectly. Because Bulgaria, obviously, Serbia, Montenegro, all these, these countries are very small, but they're Orthodox and Slavic. So they kind of become tributaries or vassal states of Russia, and they would actually prefer that to being provinces of the Ottoman Empire. You had a similar issue in the Caucasus. 
once again, while the, the Armenians are technically kind of a different church, it was kind of a close enough thing. If they had to pick a master between the Russians and the Ottomans, most of them opted to go for the Russians, particularly later on when a desperate Ottoman Empire started deporting and genociding them. So from that point on, the Ottoman Empire was basically inevitably going to lose all of its European provinces. Unless the specter of Russia went away, and Russia became progressively stronger as time went on, uh, eventually far eclipsing the Ottomans' power, so long as Russia was there and offered support both covertly and overtly to various emerging nationalist movements within the, the Balkans, they were eventually going to lose them. And any time that the people would rise up there in Bulgaria or Serbia or wherever, the Russians would march to war on their side, beat the crap out of the Ottomans, and succeed in either making the area annexed to Russia become an autonomous vassal or, or gain complete independence. And over time, they just lost more and more territory in Europe. And, and the thing is that Europe was really the important part of the Ottoman Empire. We, 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 For whatever reason, we associate them as being more Middle Eastern. But the vast majority of their bureaucrats, soldiers, wealth, etc. came from Europe. They, they preferred to use Europeans in pretty much every position that they could find. And so as they started to lose these core areas of the empire... Their main sources of recruitment dried up. Their main source of tax revenues dried up. Keep in mind, the Ottoman Empire was very, very sparsely populated. By the time of World War I, all of the Middle East and Anatolia and whatever they had left in Romalia was only like 18 million people. It was a very small country given its, its amount of land. And like I said, they had lost basically most of their important population. The only area that still had a significantly important population was Anatolia itself, the, the Turkish-speaking heartland. So to kind of go back to what I was saying with the reforms, no amount of reform, no amount of democracy, no amount of pandering, no amount of equality was going to change the fact that at the end of the day, the Ottoman Empire was an Islamic, Turkish, Arabic, Persian synthesis empire. And the people in those countries were Slavic or Romanian or Bosnian or Greek, and they were not Muslim, they were Christian. So it didn't really matter what they did, nothing could change the underlying problems there. No amount of reform, no amount of liberalization could have stabilized the situation. So I think it was kind of inevitable the empire was, go was going to break up. Probably the best they could have hoped for, and they were trying to do this around the time of World War I, but they kind of got dragged. The whole getting dragged into World War I thing is kind of complicated. But the idea, the eventual idea was, okay, we're going to industrialize Anatolia and the Arab provinces, and we're going to try to build this up as kind of a nation state, as kind of a more modern nation state. That's, if not necessarily ethnically based, it's like a, it, we just will have two, ma uh, two main ethnicities, Arab and Turkish, and maybe some like Armenians and stuff like that and Kurds. But it was going to be a much smaller, more homogenous area that would be a lot easier to control. There was never really that much of a, um, much revolts going on. The only real revolts they faced in the Arab region were like the Saudis and the Wahhabists. Who other Muslims hated, actually, because they thought they were lunatic Puritans, because they were lunatic Puritans. What ultimately kind of costed them the Kurds and the Middle East, aside from just losing in World War I, was once the Ottomans lost Egypt, Medina, and Mecca, their claim to be the, the, the head of pan-Islam really kind of fell apart. They had lost a lot of their legitimacy, and it became very difficult to kind of keep that up. It's interesting, though, because the position of Caliph was so respected that uh, when Ataturk was going to dissolve the position, Muslim rulers from across the globe, as far away as India, begged to just have the Caliph relocate there. They didn't want the position gone. They were happy to acknowledge him as at least the nominal head of Sunni Islam. But obviously, that's not what wound up happening. And by the end... The rump state of the Ottoman Empire became the modern-day Turkey, and they defined, I guess you could say, the, the successor state as being just a, a purely Turkish ethnic nation-state. And that's why 
it, kind of the Armenian genocide and all of that is, is talk for another time. But the goal in the end was to create a relatively homogenous, viable Turkish state in Rumelia and Anatolia that could not further be broken apart. And so that's kind of the tale of the fall of the Ottoman Empire. A, a, a fascinating multinational, multicultural, Islamic nation based on loyal personal loyalty to the Sultan that despite its best efforts of reform really was never able to catch up again after the 30 years war and the the second battle of Vienna. It was just kind of loss after loss after loss. And part of the reason it lasted as long as it did was that the great powers didn't want anyone else to have that area. The British and French didn't want the Russians to overrun the Balkans and become the, the global hegemony hegemon. And the Russians didn't want the, British or the French to take the area either. So that's kind of what left them going as long as it did. So I hope you enjoyed that video. I think I'm going to do a Making a Modernity. I think episode three of Making a Modernity. The third episode of Making a Modernity, I think is just going to be about the Ottoman Empire and kind of telling the fall of it and talking about like the Tanzimat reforms and, and stuff like that, maybe some more specific incidents. Because it really is, I think, the best example of why the old world collapsed and why how we got the modern world how we got to where we are so i hope you enjoyed the video god bless everyone this is argent as always we must dissent